and good morning and welcome to worship at Baptist Temple. I'm so glad that you're here today on this 12th Sunday after Pentecost. The summertime is over. Uh, the school year has begun. Uh, the Baptist Temple's program year has begun. The choir is back. Uh, no Tide July is long gone. Uh, and so here we are beginning a new year essentially together. And I'm so glad that you've chosen to be part of it today. If you're visiting our church this morning, you are indeed our very special guest. And we warmly welcome you not only this morning, but we would love to see you back again with us next Sunday for coffee, for Bible studies, for worship, for any special events that are coming up. We welcome all people, and that certainly includes each of you. This morning, all of us are here for uh, this purpose, this noble purpose of the worship of God. And so we will do so together by turning our minds' attentions and our hearts' affections on God and on the things of God on his creation, on his great love for us. And so our opening hymn this morning states just that. It's number 281, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling. Let us stand together as we sing. together in prayer. O living God, creator, sustainer, and redeemer of all through Jesus Christ, we ask you to be present among us. Lord, if you are not present with us, we will perish in the wilderness. 
Oh, Lord, if you are not our Lord and Savior, where would we go? We ask you, O Lord, present among us to enable our worship. Open our minds to understand. Open our hearts submissively to receive. O Lord, by your Spirit in worship, as we hear your word, as we offer our prayers and hymns of faith, as we listen to anthems of praise, we ask you, transform us. Enable us, because of the renewing of the mind, to offer you the worship that you are due. O Lord, we submit ourselves, our bodies, ourselves, as instruments of your praise, of your righteousness, of your work in the world. And now we ask you, by the power of your Spirit, so to change our minds and hearts so that we are able to do your work. Enable us, O Lord, transform us, and cause us to be a people who live in a way that is worthy of your name and of your praise. Lord, we ask you to bless, bless our worship, bless the one who speaks, Bless those who sing and quicken the instruments to enable a faithful worship in spirit and in truth. O oh Lord, we ask these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
we remember that all that we have is God's. We know that all that we are, all that we have been, and all that we can and will ever be is because of God, because of his great love for us. And so this morning, we come now to a time of giving back to God in response to his rich blessings. We do so with grateful and thankful and happy hearts. We do so because giving reminds us to consider the needs of others above our own. Giving reminds us of the great cause of Christ that we attempt each day and each week to serve here at Baptist Temple. And we have provided ways that you can give your tithes and offerings. You can do so in a moment in the offering plate. You can also go online. You can send a text message. However you give, though, do so generously. However you choose to give, do so in the way that God has led you. And now as we prepare to give uh, through this time of offertory, we sing a hymn of praise together, number 366, O God Beyond All Praising. Let us stand together as we sing. Dear Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for this, this morning, this opportunity to get together and worship you, um, to get closer to you, to hear the message, and, and pray that we'll take that message and, and go out in the world this week and, and live for you and all that we do. We want to lift up our, our staff. We have so many people that are helping us at Baptist Temple and helping minister to, to, to us and our, our kids. And so thankful for Jane and Aurora. Thankful for Andy. Thankful for Shannon, our choir. Eileen, Walter. We're so thankful for Eddie, Paul, and Dr. Robert Sloan. We're just so thankful for them and their families. Pray you'll lift them up and help them help us grow your kingdom right here at Baptist Temple. Pray that you'll bless this offering, that it, you'll bless the gift and the giver. And we're just so thankful for everything you've done for us here at Baptist Temple. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. The Old Testament lesson this morning comes from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 2, beginning in verse 4. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord. What wrong did your ancestors find in me, that they went far from me, and went after worthless things, and became worthless themselves? They did not say, where is the Lord who bought us up from the land of Egypt, who led us in the wilderness, in the land of deserts and pits, in the land of drought and deep darkness, in the land that no one passes through, where no one lives? I brought you into a plentiful land to eat its fruits and its good things. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priest did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handle the law did not know me. The rulers transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. Therefore, once more, I accuse you, <laughs> says the Lord, and I accuse your children's children. Cross the coast of Cyprus and look, send to Kedar and examine with all care. See if there has ever been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for something that does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, says the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and dug out cisterns for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.
This morning's New Testament lesson is from Luke 14, verse 1, and then verses 7 through 14. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you're invited by someone to a wedding banquet, don't sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. The host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, When you give a luncheon or dinner, don't invite your friends or your brothers, your relatives or rich neighbors in case they might invite you in return, and you'd be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. And you'll be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll end up in Luke eventually. Um, I'm actually going to preach a little bit more from Jeremiah. Um, So if you want to have Jeremiah 2 open, you can. Um, But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to Luke in the end. Um, Jeremiah is one of my favorite prophets. All the prophets are sort of my favorite, but um, the reason I love the prophets is they just don't flinch. Uh, they've been, uh, they might stumble in the beginning, you know, God tells them to give a word and they just, you know, they say, no, I don't, I don't feel equipped for that. I don't think I could. Uh, but then eventually God assures them, no, I'm going to give you what words to speak. My spirit will empower you. You'll be able to do it. Just go do it. And then eventually, uh, eventually they do. And when they do, when they get rolling, they really just, they don't pull any punches. They don't flinch. They, they stare the, the, uh, the guiltiness or the hard-heartedness of their, of, their, of their own people, the people that they share with. They, they stare it in the face and they, and they, they speak um, honest, honestly to them. Uh, they speak the word that God has really given them to speak. And this is what you see in Jeremiah too. Uh, so the basic context that you, you see in the prophets is, um, we, we've talked about it a lot in Sunday school. If you haven't been there, you'll, you'll, you, it's, it's worth it to know. The prophets operate in basically three different modes of discourse. Um, they are often told uh, to warn the people, uh, to tell them that, hey, you know, you've been... Astray, you've been going astray, you've not kept God's law. If you keep going that route, then God's discipline is coming. So kind of warning mode is one of those modes. The other mode is what I call a doom discourse. And it basically just means you've not listened to the warning. Now that discipline I warned you about, it's coming. So just buckle up and endure. Um, the third mode is restoration, uh, where he, the prophet tells the people, look, you endured all that bad stuff. I told you that doom was coming, and it came, but now you're on the other side of it, and I promise you God will bring you out of this. Um, and so those kind of three modes, again, are um, warning, doom, and restoration. Um, this is the warning and sliding into doom mode. Um, restoration comes, that's what we'll end up in Luke 14, uh, but Jeremiah is basically operating in sort of the doom mode here. And what he's doing, he's addressing the people, and the way that these prophetic passages often work is they go through three, uh, three stages. They indict the people, they list their transgressions, they tell them what's going to happen to them, um, so the sentencing, um, and then they often say that God is the faithful one, he'll keep his promises, both to punish, but also to restore on the other side of it. Um, and so Jeremiah is going to do that. He's about to uh, face the people and indict them of their transgressions and then tell them what's going to happen to them. Um, the reason, again, I love the prophets is because, of course, Jesus is one of them. Uh, as Christians, of course, I, 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 we believe Jesus is much more than a prophet. He's the beloved son of God, the embodiment of, of, of God to his people. Um, but he also, in his ministry to Israel, he also functions like a prophet, and he's, he's, he's called as such in the Gospels. Um, and 
Jesus is going to do the same thing. Um, you notice that he got invited to a banquet and then um, critiqued the hosts. That takes a lot of uh, not flinching. Um, okay, here's Jeremiah. Here's his indictment. He says, Hear the word of Yahweh, O house of Jacob, all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says Yahweh, What injustice did your fathers find in me that they went far from me? They walked after emptiness and they became empty. They walked after emptiness and so they became empty. This is a characteristic poetic utterance from the prophets. Uh, they often trade on these kinds of puns. Um, you, you, uh, in Isaiah 5, it's one of my favorite, they, um, he says, uh, I looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. I looked for righteousness, but behold, crying out. Um, you missed the pun in English because we translate it. In, in Hebrew, it's, it's basically the same term. He says, I looked for mishpat, justice, but instead I got bloodshed, mishpach. I looked for righteousness, tzedakah, but instead I got a crying out, tzedakah. Similarly here, this isn't a word play, but it is sort of, it's, 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 a, it's a poetic way of describing what happens to the people when they pursue empty things is you become empty. It's said again in 2 Kings 17 when it says when the people pursued their idols, they pursued vanity and became vain. They pursued futility and became futile. They pursued the wind and became gas bags. Paul actually says the same thing in Romans 1. The people pursued foolishness and they became foolish. The basic tenet here is that the thing that you direct your mind and attention and focus on is what you become like. You're always being shaped by something. And so the thing that you uh, uh, put your mind and attention and heart and focus on, it ends up having a shaping effect on you. And so if you put your mind and attention and heart and affection on God and God's own way that he has for you, you become more like God. If you set Jesus' own self and his own teaching before your eyes and attempt to follow it, you become more like Jesus. This is basically Paul's exhortation to his communities. He says, imitate me because I imitate Jesus really well. Or imitate Christ himself. Or Follow the Spirit, and in that way, you'll be more conformed to the image of God's Son. The reverse of that is you pursue vanity and you become vain. You pursue emptiness and you become empty. The content, the way they did that is that they abandoned Yahweh. The, the basic command that they were given is to worship Yahweh alone, love him with your whole heart, and instead they didn't. They followed other gods. They followed other powers. They, they went ways that God told them not to. Um, in 2.8, so Jeremiah 2.8, it says, the, 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 those who handled the law didn't know me. The rulers or the shepherds transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal, another god, and they walked after things that did not profit. They pursued stuff that doesn't ever pay you back, doesn't actually ever help you in your time of need. Verse 2.13 uh, says it, well, it says that they, they forsook the fountain of living waters and exchanged them for cisterns that leak. He's trying to describe the utter silliness of doing this. Walking away from the fountain of living water that never stops flowing and it's free and it gives you life and exchanging that and said, I'd rather have this rusty bucket that leaks. That's the way he describes what it means to turn your back away, not just from God, but also what God calls his people to. He says that they relied on idols. Look at verse 26 and 8. Verses 26 through 20, 28. He says, as the, sheep, uh, excuse me, as the thief is shamed when he's discovered, so the house of Israel is shamed. They, their kings, their princes, their priests, and their prophets, they say to a tree, you're my father. And to a stone, you gave me birth. They turned their back on me and not their face. In other words, uh, it, was, it was common in ancient Israel. Um, 
uh, uh, Israel's neighbors um, worshipped other gods. You'll, you'll have seen this if you've read through the book of Joshua or Judges. They're warned not to imitate the practices of the other nations because those other nations worship other gods. So, for example, Canaan was one of those nations that was always around them. Uh, and they were told, uh, don't imitate uh, the Canaanites because they worship other gods and I don't want you to worship them, right? Uh, the Canaanites worshipped a goddess called Asherah. Um, she was a goddess. Uh, a lot of people regarded her as like the goddess of fertility, that sort of thing. And she was often depicted as uh, a, just a wooden pole or a tree. And so he's accusing them of going to a tree and saying, you're my father, or to a stone and saying, you gave me birth. In other words, going to depictions of these false gods and claiming that they're really the ones who made them. Relying on them when they're utterly unreliable. And then, when time gets really tough, but in the time of their trouble, verse 27, they will say, arise God and save us. In other words, they spend their time worshiping rocks and trees, and then when time gets tough, they turn to Yahweh and say, could you please help us now? So God says, where are your gods, the ones that you made for yourself? Let them get up. See if they can save you in your time of trouble. In other words, we worship idols when it suits us because it's really easy to tell an idol what to do. The reason I worship idols rather than God is because I'm in control of the idol. I shape the idol. I make it what I want it to be. I have control over it, not me. The problem is that only works as long as things are going well. As soon as you feel like you need something or want something, you cry out to that rock or stone to help you, and of course it can't because it's a rock. You just made it. The prophets make fun of them for that. You say, you guys, you just cut the tree down and made an idol out of it. And then with the leftover wood, you made a fire and cooked your food on it. And now you're worshiping it? You think it's going to help you? you? It's a tree. You just cut it down. Open your eyes. We do it, though, again, because it's easy, because I'm in control of the idol. And I can tell it what to do, that sort of thing. But notice what happens. When this happens, he goes on, to, this is still the indictment, telling them all the things they've done. He says, verse 29, why do you contend, contend with me? You've all transgressed against me. Verse 34, on your skirts, so just on your clothes, is found the lifeblood of the innocent poor. You did not find them breaking in, but in spite of all these things, you said, I'm innocent. In other words, your way of life, personal injustice leading oftentimes to economic injustice, leading oftentimes to the grinding of the poor, is what, is what uh, another prophet says, why do you grind the face of the poor in the ground? Don't you know I, Yahweh, love these people? Don't you know that to know me means to love the poor? That's what he says later in Jeremiah. He says, but instead of loving the poor and, 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 and pursuing justice in such a way that the poor don't get ground up under their feet, instead what's happening is the lifeblood of the innocent poor are found on your clothes. You're living in such a way that grinds under people under your feet. And you try to defend yourself saying, hey, well, they broke into my house. No, you didn't. You didn't find them breaking in. And you still proclaim your innocence. And then finally, I'll skip a couple chapters forward. Go to 4, 23 to 26. Again, one of my favorite passages, just, just for the sake of it showing how artful the prophets are and how artful the words that God gives them are. Jeremiah has indicted the people and told them that judgment is coming. God's not going to, he, he's warned the people to, to go, to, 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 to not follow these ways, but he says, but now that you haven't listened, judgment is coming, and it's going to be like chaos. I'm going to make the world descend back into chaos. That's what my judgment will be like, because that's the, that's, that's the world you've created. You've already made the world a chaotic place by your injustice, so I'm going to now let it descend into the chaos that you yourselves have created. And look at verse, chapter 4, verse 23 through 26, and see if you notice it. I looked on the earth, and behold, it was formless and void. I looked to the heavens, and 
they had no light. I looked on the mountains, and behold, they were quaking. All the hills moved around. I looked, and behold, there was no man. All the birds of the heavens had fled. I looked, and behold, the fruitful land was a wilderness. Do you want to recognize where this language comes from? It's from Genesis 1 and 2. This is the reversal of the creation narrative. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void. And then God made the heavens, and he made the lights, and then he made the, the Garden of Eden, a fruitful land, and then he placed man into it. And he made the birds of the, birds of the air, etc. Jeremiah says that God's judgment is like a reversal of all that. It's, it's, it's God's good, ordered world descending back into chaos as simply the organic outworking of the chaotic place you've already made it. It's already chaotic. And God's judgment sort of just concretizes it. I was thinking about why we do this. Um, I mean, everybody does it. I do it. Ancient Israel does it. Modern Christians do it. Jesus' disciples did it. We do it. I do it. Um, I was wondering why we do it. Why do we pursue emptiness? You even know something's empty and you might keep going. Generally, I think for me, it's because it's easier um, and because it Think it re- we think that it rewards us right now. We do the easier thing or the empty thing or the vain thing because we think it's going to get us the reward that we want right now. And the thing is, is sometimes it does. Sometimes you do get instantly rewarded by pursuing emptiness. Uh, but the reward itself is typically shallow and it's typically not lasting. It only lasts is long enough till you want another one, another reward just like it. I think we pursue idols for the same reason, because we can control them. They're not in control of us. I get to dictate the idol's life, so now I'm in control of my own. I think we do the same with money. I think we pursue money because of the, the status we think it brings us. I don't mean money in the sense of like your capacity to pay your bills and buy a house and get food. Those are good things. God wants you to have that. I mean money in the sense of the accumulation of wealth for wealth's sake and the desire and, and because of the status that you think it brings you. I think we pursue those things because they bring us a certain clout or certain status in other people's eyes. And that status itself is the implicit current currency that regulates your access to the inner circle. The status these things bring, they function as the implicit currency that regulates your entry into the inner circle that you think you want to be in. The worst thing in the world might be that you actually get that and then discover that God's not at that table. I think Jesus says you might gain the whole world, but lose your soul. You might gain access to the inner circle you've always desired and you found out that Jesus is sitting at a different table. And I think we think these things make us great in the only way that these things matter. There, there are things that make you great, but we think only a certain, certain kinds matter. When you turn to Luke 14, I think you get an example of Jesus as another prophet of Israel. Of course, more than a prophet. Our Savior, the beloved Son of God who embodies God's presence to us and and saves us from our sin. But also functioning as a prophet coming to God's people to teach them what it means to live rightly in God's kingdom. And here's what he says. He says, Verse 12, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, don't invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they invite you in return and repayment come to you. 
But instead, give, when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed since they don't have the means to repay you, for you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. In other words, that's what I was trying to say earlier about I think we pursue these things like status and money because of, we, of the reward they will get right now. I'm nice to, the, to one of the higher-ups in my whatever business or university or just in my friend group because of the benefit I think I can get out of it. Not because being nice to somebody is just a good thing in general. And so Jesus doesn't just say, don't do that. He teaches you to do the opposite. Be good to those who can't repay you. And you'll get everything thrown in together. You'll get the joy of being with those people. And you'll get the, the, the blessing of, of, of sitting at the table at the kingdom of God at the resurrection. And I've said this a lot. Uh, the reason that God and, and Christ commands us to do these things is because we don't set the invitation list for the banquet. God does. And the people that he is pursuing is, well, of course, it's everybody. But the people who often respond to him in the Gospels are precisely the people that we often tend to exclude on our own. They're often described in, in the Gospels as the sinners. I think, I think Jesus and the Gospels, I think they endorse that line, that they really do believe that these people are sinners. But by being sinners, they're not automatically excluded. Rather, they turn out to be the people that Jesus pursues. It's what he says uh, when the Pharisees critique him and say, why are you eating with sinners and tax collectors? He's like, why do you think I came? I came to call these people to repentance. He said, the healthy don't need a doctor, the sick do. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hanging out with the sick because I'm a doctor. And Jesus goes to these people, brings them to the table, and so Jesus is saying, if you want to sit at the table with me, they're here too, so get used to it. And so, he goes on, it's outside of the, the passage I was assigned, but I'm going to just cheat a little, I already did in Jeremiah. Um, it says in verse 15, it says, when one of those who was reclining at the table, they, they heard him say all this, he said, well, blessed is everyone who eats bread in the kingdom of God. And he said to him, well, a certain man was giving a big dinner, and he invited lots of people. At the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who'd been invited and say, come, everything's ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I've bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. The other one said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I have to try, to try them out. Please consider me excused. The other guy said, I've married a wife. For that reason, I can't come. The slave came back and reported this to his master, and the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, well, then go out into the streets and the lanes and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And they said, Master, we did all that. There's still room. And he said, well, then go out even farther, out to the hedges, and compel them to come in. I want my house filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my dinner. The reason these people become the focal point of Jesus' ministry is not abstract. Again, it actually goes back to some of the Jeremiah stuff we talked about, where, where, where the, 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 the kind of sin that the people were committing were creating these kinds of scenarios where the poor, the blind, the crippled, and the lame were excluded. Do you remember from Jeremiah 2, or Jeremiah yeah, 2, where he said, the, the lifeblood of the innocent poor is on your skirts, is on your clothes. And because of the dire situation that the, the, not just the people of Israel is, not just the people of Israel are in, but also just the state of the world, the fact that it's crushed under a weight of its own mortality, God says that when, when, when the restoration occurs, he will finally bring to an end all of these pains. He says, when restoration occurs, the blind will see and the ears will be opened, the lame will walk and the deaf will hear. And Jesus is the one bringing that restoration. So he includes these people because he's the one healing them. He's the one bringing the restoration that brings to an end their plights. And so the reason I think that we, to go with Jeremiah and Jesus, that we need to 
pursue things that are full, pursue the way of God rather than emptiness, is not simply because when the time comes you'll be found unworthy. I think Jesus implies that as well. He says, none of those men who are invited shall taste my dinner. But also because when the invitation comes, you might find that you actually don't want it. If you've spent your whole life pursuing empty things, and then the reign of God shows up and Jesus says, come to the reign of God, you might just not want the invitation (laughs) because you might not think it's worth your time. That's the scarier thing to me is that you pursued empty things your whole life so that you yourself have become empty. You don't want the right things anymore. So that when Jesus comes along and offers you a place at the table, you say no because you really don't want it. So, that means we need to pursue the things that bring life. The Gospels give us images of this. They, they, they give us an image of Zacchaeus. So be like Zacchaeus, who sees Jesus, and though he was rich and had probably gotten a lot of it by exploitation, said, Jesus, I've got to eat with you. Or Jesus said, Zacchaeus, I've got to eat with you. They sit together, and Zacchaeus, being faced with Jesus, says, I'm selling half my possessions. And if I've wronged anybody, I'm giving them four times that amount. And Jesus says, salvation's come today to Zacchaeus' house. Or be like the woman who, when she saw Jesus, she didn't regard her expensive jar of oil or perfume as worth using on herself. She said, I'd rather use this to anoint Jesus for his burial. The disciples complain, and she says, man, Jesus, Jesus says, she did something beautiful for me. Or, of course, be like Jesus, who walks in the way of his father and brings others into that walk. Who doesn't pursue status for the things that it can get him in, 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 in this earthly life, but out of obedience to his father, he includes all those who will turn to him. Because that's the metric of worth in the kingdom. C.S. Lewis has a great quote. It's, it's long, so I had to write it down here. Um, it's in The Great Divorce. And in this book called The Great Divorce, it's about... Um, in this scene, uh, this, this person is, is, is receiving a tour uh, of heaven. And she's seeing a parade of people pass by. And says, first came the bright spirits who danced and scattered flowers. These flowers were falling down soundlessly. Each petal weighed 100 pounds. Then on the left hand side of those bright spirits of this parade that she sees in heaven, she says, at each side of that forest came youthful shapes, boys upon one hand and girls upon the other. If I could remember their singing and write down their notes, no man who ever read that song would ever grow sick or old. And between them went musicians. And after these, a lady in whose honor all this was being done. She sees a parade of musicians and bright spirits singing and throwing flowers for this woman. And he says, is it, is that, he's trying to ask, is this Mary? Because he assumes this must be Mary, mother of God. And the guide said, no, not at all. It's someone you've never heard of. Her name on earth, her name on earth was Sarah Smith, and she lived on Golders Green. And the person said, well, she seems to be a person of particular importance. And the guide says, that's right, she's one of the great ones. You've heard that fame in this country and fame on earth are two quite different things. She was just the woman on your street who lived her life not exalting herself but humbling herself in a life of simplicity on behalf of others. And she's not great in our in our eyes because we don't, we don't esteem things rightly. But as he said, the fame on earth and fame in heaven are quite different things. So pursue the greatness as it's defined by the reign of God. Because God's reign's coming and it's 
filled and led by people who do such things, who are full of mercy and humility in service of others. I'll pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time together. I thank you for each of these people. I ask that you give us the courage to uh, walk away from things that are vain and empty and uh, bring us uh, empty status. And I pray for the courage and the faith and the humility to walk in the paths that your son set before us, the path of loving others with our whole selves, with our time, our energy. We ask, Lord, um, that you guide us this upcoming week uh, in the ways that you have before us. For each of us individually, they're different, but we know that you go before us. We thank you, Lord, for your many gifts, for the gift of your son, for the gift of your spirit that you've given us that guides us and shapes us and molds us. We trust you, Lord, and we pray these things in the name of your Son. Amen. Indeed, we have all heard from God this morning. Because we have heard, we must respond, and we'll respond together by singing this hymn of testimony, of thanksgiving, the wonderful old hymn, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. It's number 587. Would you join me in standing together as we sing? I'm so glad that you were here today. In a moment, we'll receive our benediction. And following that, you'll be dismissed. And I hope to see you all here again next Sunday. Bring a friend. Bring a family member. Bring a neighbor. Bring a coworker. Pray for someone that you didn't see this morning. Check in on them this week and let them know that Jesus loves them. Let them know their church family loves them. And minister to them. Leave this place better connected to God and better connected to each other than when you came in. Dr. Sloan. <clears throat> and the spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, 
and let the one who's thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. This week, may you drink from the fountain of the living Lord. Go in the peace of Christ.